Well, hello, my name is Barney Bynes. I teach psychology at Ithaca College, and I'm delighted to be part of this lecture series. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you to AP Psychology. You're going to be learning a lot of interesting things as you take this course. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about why psychological science uh, is important, what it can tell us about the world around us and the people around us. To start off with, one of the things that it's important to remember is that <clears throat> we all know things. But an important question <clears throat> is, <clears throat> how do you know what you know? Well, there are certain different ways that people know about the world around them, <clears throat> know about the people around them. One of them is intuition or, oh, everybody knows that to be true. Well, that may be the case, but every people have different intuitions. Your intuitions may not match those of other people. <clears throat> or you may rely on authority figures or experts. And in many cases, this makes sense because experts in their areas know a lot. Unfortunately, sometimes even experts are wrong. <clears throat> you may have learned in elementary school that people objected to Christopher Columbus sailing west to find India because he would sail off a flat earth. Well, if you learn that, it's unfortunate because it's not true. Everybody in Columbus's day <clears throat> knew that the world was round. But some experts, that is teachers, may have misled you because sometimes experts can be wrong. <clears throat> We also know about life around us. We know about people from personal experience. And while personal experience really is important to help us understand the world around us, different people experience different things and interpret them differently. So just because your personal experience says one thing, it doesn't mean <clears throat> that it matches those of other people. So what does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with science, which is really gathering systematic information. And in psychology, what we do is we say, I wonder what would happen if, and we make predictions about what people are going to be doing in one circumstance or another. And that's what psychological science is all about. <clears throat> More generally speaking, what is science? Science is a set of systematic observations and tests of predictions to help us understand the world around us. That's what science is. But what science isn't, <clears throat> science is not proof. What is science? Science is never having to say you're certain. And this might sound a little bit depressing in the sense that you might think, well, if we never know for sure, what good is the information? Well, it's really good news because a scientific approach means that when we get better information, we can change our mind about what we believe. And that is the essence of being scientifically literate, scientifically aware, being able to ask questions learning how to ask questions to improve the knowledge we have to have more confidence in what we believe. So what is scientific literacy? Well, it sounds like it's pretty profound, but in reality, it's pretty simple. It's simply knowledge and understanding of scientific concepts and processes for personal decision making, participating in civic and cultural affairs and economic productivity. And this comes from the National Academy of Sciences. And what it really means, and we're talking about psychological science now, is that if you are going to use scientific principles, scientific, be scientifically literate, you can make better decisions about your life. And if those decisions are going to be good in the long run, you're better off. And that's going to be the case when you use the best available information 
that is updated scientific information. Scientific literacy also helps you live as a member of your community. Because as you go through life, you're going to have to make decisions about various things in your community, in your life, being able to use the best information available and changing your mind when necessary really is important. And that's part of scientific literacy. And then scientific literacy is also useful for economic productivity. For example, researchers have shown that when we have ethnic and gender diversity in the workplace, economic output is better. So how do we know that is true? It's because people have done research and by updating our belief about what is a good composition in the workplace, that's going to be good for economic productivity. So there are a lot of reasons why scientific literacy is important. In terms of psychology and scientific literacy, psychology is a great discipline for learning to be scientifically literate because people are important, people are interesting. And when you learn to ask questions about people, you'll learn to ask questions in general that will lead to answers that are useful. <clears throat> so let's talk about psychological science. <clears throat> Is exercise good for you? Well, that seems like an obvious question. Of course it's good for you, everybody knows that. Once we know things, they become obvious. And so if somebody says, let's do research to see if exercise is good for you, you might say, well, why should we do that? Because we know it's true. Well, one of the strange things is that Obvious is not always obvious. That is, we're not always aware of things that later on we think, yeah, this is pretty obvious. And one of the uh, issues that we have to remember is that it's always easy when you know something to come up with an explanation as to why it's probably true. But in advance, we don't always know. So for example, research says exercise is good for you. So why is it good? What, do, what benefits do you derive from exercising? Well, we know a lot about that, but in advance, we may not know exactly what is exercise is going to do for us. Research does say exercise is increasing energy levels, reduces depression and anxiety, helps you learn, it improves your mood, it enhances your sleep. All of these things are true because we know from research. And is this now just common sense? And the answer is no, it's not common sense because people didn't know this until somebody asked the research question. And this brings uh, up the uh, research by a man named Jeremy Morris. In the 1940s, he noticed that in England, the rate of heart disease and deaths due to heart problems was skyrocketing. It was going up. Why? Well, nobody knew. He thought it might be, have something to do with exercising. So he did a study over a period of several years where he looked at the health of people who worked in the double-decker buses in London. Some of the workers, the drivers, simply sat and drove all day, while the conductors kept moving, going up and down the stairs on the double-decker buses. When he looked at their health, what he found was that the conductors were much healthier, the drivers were much more likely to have heart disease or to die over the period of two years. His conclusion was that exercise made a difference. He found the same thing with mail carriers. Mail carriers that walked all day were healthier than postal workers who stood behind a desk all day. Until Morris made this discovery, people didn't know 
that exercise was good for you. That is, what we take as being obvious now was not obvious. Somebody had to ask the question, and it was Jerry Mo Jeremy Morris who asked that question that led to the knowledge that we have now. So are psychological findings simply obvious? Well, the answer is no. What is obvious now to us was not always obvious. So now I'm gonna ask you the question, how good are you at predicting human behavior? I'm gonna show you three different research outcomes, th research studies, and for each study, three possible outcomes. And what I want you to do is try to predict what you think the correct outcome was, what was the actual result. You may want to pause this presentation while you think about them, but I'll present them and you should predict what do you think the outcome was and why did it happen the way it did. So here is our first scenario. In schools, do short tests compared to long tests lead to better performance? Do short tests lead to worse performance or is there no difference? What do you think about the length of tests and student performance on them? So here is another <clears throat> scenario. Women wearing lipstick while taking a test might score lower than women not wearing lipstick. Women wearing lipstick while taking a test might score higher than women not wearing lipstick. Or there might be no difference. What do you think is the actual outcome of this research? <clears throat> and here is a third scenario. People with high cognitive abilities, that is smart people, might be less likely than others to form social stereotypes. Or it's possible people who with high cognitive abilities are more likely than others to form social stereotypes. Or there might be no difference. What do you think? How confident are you of your guesses? <clears throat> And did you come up with a potential explanation that would allow you to say, yeah, this is why I think it happened the way it did? <clears throat> well, I've done this with my students over the years. And for these research scenarios, students were not very good at predicting the outcome. It turns out that short tests in school lead to worse performance than long tests. <clears throat> and only 20% of my students correctly predicted that research outcome. Turns out that women wearing lipstick while taking a test score higher than women who do not wear lipstick. And only 16% of my students were able to correctly predict that. And people with high cognitive abilities, that is smart people, <clears throat> are more likely to form stereotypes than others. Now that we know the results, <clears throat> we could probably come up with good explanations as to why this is the case. But if you came up with predictions that were wrong, <clears throat> you probably had a good sounding explanation. But this is the reason we do research because we don't know in advance what's going to happen until we actually do the research. <clears throat> so here's another situation of how psychology adds to what we know in what might be very important aspects of our lives. Are trigger warnings a good thing? That is, if something that might be psychologically troubling is going to come up in a conversation or discussion or in class, should we warn students in advance that you're going to hear things that might be disturbing? Well, the research that I've seen, in fact, the only research I've seen suggests that trigger warnings don't help. And in fact, they might have negative consequences. 
That's not something that I would expect most people would initially believe because people use trigger warnings like on the news all the time. But if you're psychologically literate after seeing the research, you might change your mind. <clears throat> One of the important things to keep in mind is that psychology is difficult. There's no way we can get around that. And it's always more difficult than we would like it to be. So why is it so difficult? <clears throat> well, there are a lot of reasons, but Albert Einstein knew how difficult psychology is when he is reputed to have said, understanding physics is child's play compared to understanding child's play. So what does that mean? Well, it means people are complicated. And one of the reasons is that it's never one thing. That is no single variable, no single factor is going to explain everything about a person's behavior in a given situation. There are multiple contributing causes and they might be hard to figure out. So if we wanna know about people, how do we study them? <clears throat> Well, when we can, we use experiments. And in psychology, we use experiments in a way that's a little different than scientists do in other disciplines. Psychological scientists refer to experiments as involving three particularly important characteristics. First of all, you have to manipulate the variable. That is, the researcher has to control the situation. The researcher also creates groups to compare. And then the researcher needs to assign people randomly to the different groups. And the purpose of a random assignment is to make sure that the groups, when they start the experiment, are about as comparable as they can be. That is, they're starting out being pretty much the same. If we do have these characteristics of our research, it's an experiment and as such, we can attribute cause and effect. That is, we can do our study and say, we know why things happen the way they do. We know that this causes that. If we can't manipulate variables, if we can't create groups to compare, <clears throat> and if we can't randomly assign people to the different groups, it's not a true experiment. It might give us good information <clears throat> to make us predict human behavior, but it doesn't help us get a sense of what causes the behavior. We can only get a sense of causation from experiments. Now, here's the logic of an experiment. <clears throat> Most experiments are more complicated than what this indicates, but here's the fundamental design. We can start out with two groups that are pretty much the same because we randomly assign people to the conditions. They're starting out identical. We do something to one group and we don't do something to the other group. And then we measure them to see if they behave the same or behave, behave differently. If there is a difference between groups at the end, we can conclude that what we did made a causal difference. Sometimes we can't do an experiment. So we might use correlational research. For instance, we know that a person's level of conscientiousness when they're six years old predicts their health 50 years later. Now, it's not a perfect prediction, but it's better than just guessing. We really couldn't do an experiment here. There are a lot of practical reasons, but if we wanted to, it would take 50 years to do the study. And that just doesn't make sense. But if we have data from a long time ago, even if we didn't control it, we can use the data from 50 years ago to make predictions about today. And in fact, some researchers have been able to do that. 
which is why we know that a person's level of conscientiousness when they are a child predicts how healthy they're going to be when they are in adulthood. So correlational studies are important and informative and they help us make good predictions, but they don't let us know why things happen the way they did. That's why we need experiments. But it gets complicated because again, people are complicated. <clears throat> so once again, here's the logic of an experiment. We control situations, see if what we do makes a difference in behavior. The problem is that there are all kinds of extraneous variables and confounds. That is, there are other factors that we might not know about that are having a difference. So if you think back on the lipstick study, what you might say is, let me wear lipstick and I'll do better on a test. Well, you've introduced a new variable, a new idea, so that knowing about the lipstick is going to influence the way you approach a task. The inf it will influence the way you take the test. So all of a sudden now, there is a new factor we have to consider in order to understand what's going on. So the lipstick effect might not hold true if you know too much about the phenomenon. It gets complicated. And we need to keep in mind whenever we talk about psychological factors that it's always more complicated than we want it to be. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what might be one of the most famous studies in psychology the Stanford Prison Study. In this research, the investigator actually created a jail in the basement of the psychology building at Stan Stanford University and assigned certain people to be guards and certain people to be prisoners. They actually built a jail and the, the prisoners were not allowed to leave. They were actually locked in. The result, in part, <clears throat> was that some of the guards became very abusive. And in fact, the, the study had to be stopped earlier than the researchers had hoped because things were getting out of control. And the researchers wound up concluding that people adopt behaviors consistent with the roles they are in. So this is a very, very famous study and you'll learn more about it as you go through AP psychology. One of the complications was it's not a true experiment. It was an observational study. That is, there was no manipulation of variables, no creation of groups to compare how does this group behave when I do this as opposed to how does that group behave when I do that. Some researchers now believe that the guards were encouraged to be abusive. If this is actually the case, there's no surprise. That's not necessarily the role of being the guard. It might be that they were encouraged to be abusive. In addition, not all of the guards actually were abusive. And in fact, in some research since this, original Stanford prison study, experimenters have had a hard time getting people to be abusive toward people in other groups. So it's not necessarily the role of being a guard that is the problem. It might be the nature of the people who were willing to participate in this study. And in fact, in the recent research, the investigators had created two groups when they advertised for participation in one study, they said, this is a study of prison life. In the other group, they didn't say anything about prisons. They looked at the type of people who were attracted to each of the type of study, 
And what they found was that the participants who wanted to sign up for the prison study were high in aggressiveness and narcissism and low in empathy and altruism compared to the ones who signed up for a study that did not involve prison life. So this indicates that you have to be very, very careful in the conclusions you, you draw. The Stanford prison study was not an experiment. So although it can give us some good information, it's very limited because we don't know what the cause was. It may not be what the researchers thought it was. So in spite of the fact that psychology is complicated, and that results may be hard to interpret, we have had a lot of successes. <clears throat> so for example, research shows that stereotype threat exists. Being in a situation where you aren't supposed to do well can actually diminish your performance. Well, why is this a success to know this? Well, it's a success because once we know it, we can figure out how to overcome the problem. Psychologists have also <clears throat> studied how to get the most out of online learning, which is pretty important right now. In addition, you may have heard about people being auditory learners or visual learners with different learning styles. Well, psychological research has shown that that's not the case, that's a myth. People who may prefer visual or auditory learning turn out to learn just as well, regardless of how the information is presented. <clears throat> Psychological scientists have also <clears throat> discovered that you cannot multitask effectively. <clears throat> what you do when you try to multitask is to switch back and forth between tasks, which means you wind up not doing either one particularly well. And as an example of that, imagine counting from one to 10 as quickly as you can. You could do that real fast. Imagine progressing in the alphabet from the letter A to J, the 10th letter. You can do that pretty fast. Now try to do it by alternating one A, two B, three C and so forth. Well, that's a version of multitasking. And if you try to do that, you get very, very slow. Why? Because you have to switch back and forth across tasks and you can't do it very well. Researchers have also shown that depressed people like sad music. <clears throat> and you might say, well, that's pretty obvious. Well, it's not obvious till we do the research but in addition, the question is, why might that be the case? Well, it turns out that it seems that depressed people like sad music because it improves their mood. Not because they like wallowing in misery, but because it may help them. <clears throat> so even though things are complicated and we always have to update our information and maybe change our mind about things, one of the things that we know is we can learn those things. We can update our ideas and have more confidence that we know about people and, and what people do will be better at understanding than we were in the past. So what's the point of psychological science, of your learning about psychology? Well, you can learn how people think and behave. You can also begin to understand why they act as they do, not simply what they do, but why they do it. And the final point here is that psychology is really complicated because people are really complicated. <clears throat> and it's really the case that the more we know about people, the more interesting they become. And finally, research in psychology is the key to understanding what people do and why they do it. That's why psychological science 
can be so meaningful in all of our lives. And that's why the AP psychology course is as important as it is. So thank you for your attention. I hope that you end up finding psychology as interesting as I do, because it's the most fascinating subject that I can imagine studying. Thank you.